Um, Abby's new research also touches on this fraught moment of nation building. Um, her current book project charts the trope of breastfeeding in Irish literature and culture. And I've had the opportunity to hear her give a couple of talks on this topic. Um, where she returns to Padre Pierce's poetry, as she does in this book, um, with its language of blood sacrifice and the build up to the Easter Rising. And she finds alongside and even buried within this rhetoric the motif of the nurturing milk of the mother's breast. In this new project, she considers imagery from works as diverse as Ulysses and sings Playboy of the Western World to Nolan Gunnell's The 50 Minute Mermaid. So we look forward to hearing more about that in the future. <clears throat> For her talk today, <clears throat> Irish Jewish Studies at the Border, Precarious Solidarity from James Joyce to Ruth Gilligan, Abby returns the themes from Israelites and Aaron and offers a contemporary reading of Irish Jewish analogies in light of a very different set of geopolitical challenges. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Abby Bender. <clears throat> Back here. I think I better bring this down. Okay. Um, it's such a pleasure to be back here, and I just want to thank Kelly. Um, thank you to Miriam Nine, who I knew couldn't be here for the invitation, and to Caroline um, for managing all the arrangements. Um, I also want to thank my family for being here, and particularly my sister, who's in the midst of this documentary film symposium, and um, was actually on the CBS News tonight at 6. She's recently discovered a film of Albert Einstein in her work as a documentary archivist. So if you Google Becca Bender, CBS, or Albert Einstein, um, it's worth seeing. It's about this year-long celebration of Irish-Jewish connections, I was on a train between Dublin and Mayo after attending a conference at Trinity College, and the conference was reimagining the Jews of Ireland. And several of us there had recently published or were writing uh, books or dissertations or articles um, in what rather suddenly seemed to be this kind of coalescing field. Um, and some of us um, had been at this work for decades, um, but for the first time we were together, and we were seeing Irish Jewish studies not just as our personal topic, um, but a new discourse involving a wide range of scholars and disciplines. And in many ways, we spoke this common language um, that foregrounded things like diaspora, identity, uh, history, and memory. So many of us at the conference were contributors to a new collection um, it's called Irish Questions and Jewish Questions Crossovers in Culture, and this will be out in September, and I had the chance to preview it recently. So um, one of the most useful essays there is by Stephen Watt, um, and this is, uh, oops, I'm going for it. This middle one is his um, recent book on American literature and the Irish Jewish Unconscious. Um, and I've just included here a couple other recent books um, in the field, and I should say, I tried not to overcrowd the, um, the slides with references. I think this turns out to be a little small to see. Um, there's one more for you. But um, if you want more information about anything that I've put up or spoken about, just come talk to me um, after the talk, and I'll give you the references. So um, Watt, um, in his book, points out, um, in his essay, rather, not in this book, but in this forthcoming collection, he points out that the wide range of this collection, quote, confirms the multidisciplinary bristle of a nascent Irish Jewish studies. And I love that phrase, uh, multidisciplinary bristle, uh, because it doesn't ignore this kind of productive disagreement that happens when scholars from different disciplines talk to each other across borders of scholarly fields. Um, which are not always as borderless as inter or interdisciplinary as we might think. Um, and in fact, I think that much more conversation and encounter, particularly between literary critics and historians in these fields, can and should happen, um, as it has in more established fields like Black Irish Studies. Um, and of course, John Waters has been teaching um, that course here, I think, for, for a number of years. The, the, the Black Atlantic is also known. So when I gave my title for this talk some months ago, um, At the Border, 
uh, which is in my title, was mostly rhetorical. Um, and certainly I was thinking about borders and immigration and identity, as uh, I think we all are lately. Um, but of course, in recent weeks, we've seen increased attention to all of the borders involved in both Irish and Jewish studies. So one question that kind of hovers around the edges of my talk is this. Um, in an era of neo-nationalism, of Trump and Brexit, what does it mean to participate in any studies rooted in a national or cultural identity? Uh, Irish studies or Jewish studies or any other combination. Um, and in particular, I want to consider the affinities and solidarities uh, between cultures, uh, but also the precariousness of that solidarity. It's kind of slippery nature, the tensions that often break it apart or coalesce it into yet more fixed identities. Um, and most of all, I want to recognize the ethical urgency uh, of seeing and accommodating the ironies uh, of both nationalism and transnationalism, mm. the value of empathy and also its limits. So the very practice of transnational analogy presumes at least imaginatively that the border of the nation is not a wall but a bridge. Uh, but that analogy isn't fixed. Analogy in general isn't. It shifts, it fractures under all sorts of pressures, um, and those very blocks that built the bridge can also be remade into a wall. Uh, my book examined um, an imagined, if not actual, solidarity between two peoples, and then, um, as Kelly said, the subsequent erasure of that solidarity. Uh, the Irish-Jewish analogy was once ubiquitous in Ireland. From about the 17th century, it was widespread, though its origins were earlier, and it remained a staple of proto-nationalist and nationalist thinking into the first decade of the 20th century. So by 1904, the year in which James Joyce's Ulysses is set, uh, the trope of Irish-Jewish alikeness, and often this was um, measured, <coughs> excuse me, in a common sense of suffering, right? We have suffered um, only as much as we as other people, um, had become a well-rehearsed commonplace, and it was as likely to be found in a parodic street ballad as a committee room uh, speech. And I should say that more precisely, the analogy was actually Irish-Israelite, right? Um, with the biblical Israelites, not um, Irish-Jewish alikeness. So it was these biblical interests um, that, that kind of worked and the appearance of actual living Jews um, who immigrated to Ireland in those years was one of the factors in the analogy's decline. Uh, but James Joyce was in earnest about excavating the complexities of the analogy, and he described Ulysses as a, quote, epic of two races, Israel, Ireland. Jews have continued to live in Ireland with hybrid identities like that of Ulysses' Irish Jew, Leopold Bloom, but the literal community has diminished as the imaginative one did. Uh, the Adelaide Road Synagogue, for example, this is a <coughs> come to a little out of order here, sorry. Um, this is in Dublin, uh, built in 1892, was decommissioned in 1999. At the conference I mentioned earlier, our keynote speaker, Brian Chayat, um, suggested that the small but notable attention at the moment is also the recognition of an ending. Uh, we can only talk about the Irish-Jewish connection precisely because it no longer substantially exists. Uh, yet the energy around this field of scholarship is notable. So in addition to the books published in the past few years, there's been an exhibition on representations of Jews in Irish literature, and that's the, the um, bottom logo um, that promises a um, multi-volume accompanying publication soon. Um, an anthology of Irish Jewish writing is in development. Uh, and Ruth Gilligan's 2016 novel, um, that explores the multiple kind of generation story of Irish Jewish experience. And I'll return to that novel at the end of my talk um, because it's a text that takes the experience of the Irish Jewish other uh, and the possibilities and limits of connection as its central theme. 
And this is also the theme of Ulysses, of course. Um, so starting with Joyce's novel, I want to look at two speeches uh, where we find walls where once there were bridges. And both of these speeches are set on June 16th, uh, Bloom's Day to readers of Ulysses. So Bloom, of course, the most famous, the fictional Irish Jew, um, is the stranger in the house, the dark horse, the half and half, right? No matter that he too is Irish. Um, and Joyce said of his protagonist that uh, only a foreigner would do. Um, but it's the citizen, with a capital C, um, of Joyce's novel who most directly opposes Bloom. Those are nice things, says the citizen, coming over here to Ireland, filling the country with bugs. Mm -hmm. Swindling the peasants, says the citizens, and the poor of Ireland, we won't want no more strangers in our house. The stranger, says the citizen, <coughs> our own fault. We let them in. We brought them in. So citizen Trump, at the announcement of his presidential candidacy in 2015, and I know this seems like a long time ago, um, also on Bloomsday, June 16, sounded a similar theme. When Mexico sends its people, they're not sending you. They're sending people that have lots of problems, and they're bringing those problems with us. They're bringing drugs, they're bringing crime, they're rapists. I would build a great wall, and nobody builds walls better than me. I will build a great, great wall. Um, and at the end of the Cyclops chapter of Ulysses, after Bloom has stood up to the citizens' anti-Semitism and faced his violence, uh, Bloom ascends in mock heroic glory to God. We'll come back to Trump in a, in a moment. Um, this is Joyce, um, and this is about Bloom. When lo, this is after he's, he's been attacked by the citizen, physically attacked, um, and attacked for his Jewishness. When lo, there came about them all a great brightness, and they beheld the chariot wherein he stood, a son to heaven. And they beheld him in the chariot, clothed upon in the glory of the brightness, having raiment as of the sun, fair as the moon, and terrible, for ah, they durst not look upon him. And there came a voice out of heaven calling, Elijah, Elijah. And he answered with a mean cry, Abba, Adonai. And they beheld him, even him, Ben Bloom Elijah, amid clouds of angels, ascend to the glory of the brightness at an angle of 45 degrees over Donahoe's in Little Green Street like a shot off the shovel. <laughs> um, so this moment, like so much else in Ulysses, nearly explodes in irony, as do the other hyperbolic interruptions to the narrative throughout the Cyclops chapter. And this image of Bloom's ascension, which I find both comic and um, moving, is a sort of retort to the xenophobic rhetoric. And I won't spend time unpacking it further, except to say that in presenting Bloom as a kind of messiah, heralding, hyperbolic figure who has suffered, uh, Christ-like, and now both ascends to God um, and is also brought back to Little Green Street in that street's colloquial idiom, um, choice is being ironic. Um, Bloom is good here. Right? He is good, but surely he's not quite Elijah, uh, slingshotted as he is, like a shot off a shovel. So Trump's uh, hyperboles are often as aggrandizing as the image of an ascending bloom, but no narrative voice intervenes to highlight the irony. Or rather, uh, many do, but only after the fact. Um, if we want to frame Trump's Bloomsday speech, we might do worse than to put it into a geometric relation with Bloom and Ulysses. The figure of Bloom traveling by fiery chariot upward at a 95 degree angle is inverted at the moment when Donald Trump does not ascend, but rather descends from on high <laughs> like a god coming down to meet the press on a golden escalator, no less. Uh, so elevation on one hand and descent on the other. Uh, in the case of Trump, perhaps um, by now we're too fatigued to continue to track the rhetorical and visual ironies of each speech, but there's one more trope that is echoed by both <clears throat> citizens in their Bloomsday talk, the ironic gesture of both owning and disowning the stranger. 
and particularly the Jew. First, the citizen um, of Ulysses describes the Irish as ancestrally Jewish. Um, where are our missing 20 millions of Irish should be here today instead of four our lost tribes? In his Bloomsday announcement, Trump also invokes the Israelite analogy. They will not bring us, believe me, to the promised land. They will not. Trump, unsurprisingly, adopts uh, the biblical trope to focus on precisely the element of the Israelites' exodus story that is most troubling, the arrival in the promised land that God apparently authorizes for one people to the exclusion of all others. The Palestinian literary critic Edward Said once warned of precisely that danger in the promised land motif, that when a chosen people arrive there, the Canaanites who already live there um, are dispossessed. A promised land for a chosen people seems more or less what Trump envisions with his wall. It's the biblical analogy that was used to justify the, mana, the narrative of manifest destiny and the dispossession of Native Americans. And very recently, of course, it is also um, at work back in the land of its biblical origin at the Gaza border. This discourse of national identity of citizen and stranger is, of course, a memorial but the Israelite analogy invoked by both the citizen and Trump, by Irish, Americans, and ancient and modern Jews, is a discourse that always already contains the idea of the other within, the stranger already in the house. Trump unconsciously admits this in a Freudian slip. The bad Mexicans, uh, he says, are bringing their problems with us. Uh, this makes the us Mexican too. We are the us who migrate, the stranger, the undocumented, the unwelcome. When the citizen asks Bloom what his nation is, Bloom claims citizenship too. Ireland, he says, I was born here, Ireland. But if to be born in a place seems a reasonable claim to citizenship, we should remember that it is not the case everywhere today, including Ireland, a point I'll return to shortly. Joyce, in exposing the ironies of the citizens' rhetoric, critiques his xenophobia, his racist nationalism, his anti-Semitism. But the irony catches Bloom here, too, even before his mock heroic ascension. Bloom famously rebuts the citizen and speaks out against, quote, force, hatred, history, all that. That's not life for men and women, insult and hatred. And everybody knows that it's the very opposite of that that is really life. What's the opposite? Love, says Bloom, I mean the opposite of hatred. But Bloom is embarrassed in the moments, I must go, he says, and he exits immediately. Um, and then the text itself descends on Bloom's embarrassment. And Bloom's love is ironized in a parodic passage that begins in apparent ridicule and seems to only get worse as it goes on. Love loves to love love. <laughs> Nurse loves the new chemist. Constable 14A loves Mary Kelly. Gertie McNowell loves the boy that has the bicycle, um, et cetera, et cetera. Yet what the citizen has castigated in the chapter as, quote, universal love remains for Bloom as well as Stephen worth the ironic parody, worth the embarrassment of the moment. Love trumps hate, we might say. But in Bloom's earnestness, undone by the irony of its inevitable reversal. Uh, love trumps hate, after all, is a slogan that holds within it its own undoing. Um, love can't win over hate by trumping it uh, in either of the senses in which we might now understand that word, uh, which would ironically undo the very sense of love itself. Uh, in the passage here, maybe Joyce is warning us quite simply uh, that Bloom is naive and he's about to be physically attacked by a biscuit tin throwing anti Semite. Uh, a more recent example of where Irish transnational solidarity has run up against limits. When last year, then Irish uh, Taoiseach Enda Kenny lectured Trump on the un Americanness of US immigration policy, he seemed not to see the irony of doing so at a moment when refugees in Ireland were, and still are, um, living in the dire precarity of the direct provision system, kind of open prison 
for asylum seekers whose lives were held in the limbo of unsettlement. Kenny was broadly criticized for failing to see the hypocrisy in advocating for Irish emigrants, and here perhaps we hear echoes of the citizens, um, our lost <coughs> tribes, uh, rather than the refugees in Ireland. And moreover, since the 2004 citizenship referendum, being born in Ireland to immigrant parents has not automatically conferred citizenship. Behind Kenny's helpful observations, uh, calling out Irish American racism is a similar system at work in Ireland itself. Um, moreover, Kenny's vision of rights and hospitality for the stranger seemed to address only the undocumented Irish in America, not the much greater numbers of migrants from Latin America and other countries also affected by U.S. policy. Trump spoke of a promised land in his Bloom Bay speech, but he meant for those of us who are already here, uh, not the refugees who are displaced, exiled, unsettled. Uh, and what happens when people or nations do indeed reach their promised lands? Nationalism tends not to acknowledge hybrid beginnings, origins in wilderness, difficult struggles, or the ironic distance between those things and the stories nations tell themselves. In Ulysses, uh, Joyce repeatedly shows us the precariousness of the Irish Jewish analogy. It's potential at nearly every moment to become its opposite. Perhaps the best example is early in Ulysses when Stephen Daedalus is talking with the headmaster Deasy, who makes a joke about why Ireland never persecuted the Jews. <coughs> because she never let them in, he says, <laughs> giving his punchline quote solemnly, then laughing as he walks away. Um, in fact, Deasy has taken this quip from a tradition of Irish speech makers proclaiming just the opposite. It was an oft-repeated rhetorical claim that Ireland was the only country in the world which had never been charged with persecuting the Jews. The claim was repeated in 1828 by Daniel O'Connell, and uh, again in the years just before Ulysses is set, by a prominent Irish rabbi, and then by nationalist Michael David. Deasy lifts the trope nearly verbatim from a chain of previous users in order to turn it into its opposite. Uh, we can imagine Citizens Trump voice sounding the same joke with the mediation of Joyce's narrator reflecting back the Joker's own love of gilded embellishment. Uh, this is at the end of the chapter. On his wide shoulders, through the checkerwork of leaves, the sun <laughs> flying spangles, dancing coins. The shoulders are dizzies, but we can imagine our own citizen president in the same golden glow of sparkling coins reflected by the shiny golden interiors of Trump Tower or Mar-a-Lago. Joyce warns then of both the reversibility of the Irish Jewish motif and also its potential to become emptied of meaning. But more troubling than these is Joyce's alter ego Stephen Daedalus's engagement with the analogy. A moment after recounting with Bloom the points of contact between the Irish and the Jews, Stephen sings to his host the blood libel ballad of Little Harry Hughes. Uh, the detached narrator of the Ithaca chapter of Ulysses comments not at all on the jarring shift. One moment, Stephen and Bloom are extensively comparing, uh, quote, the points of contact that existed between their languages, Irish and Hebrew, and the possibility of Irish political autonomy or devolution. Yet the next moment, and you can see how long uh, these correspondences are, uh, <laughs> but the next moment Stephen drops these political hopes and sings of a Jew's daughter who murders a Christian boy to bake his blood into Passover matzo. So is Stephen knowingly pointing out the irony of rehearsing the Jewish-Irish analogy in the midst of anti-Semitic culture in 1904 Dublin. I mean, this is really giving him the benefit of the doubt. Um, or is Stephen simply a cab? Uh, just as we settle into the promise of connection, we are left with the irony of history and the echo of Stephen's earlier thought. History is a nightmare from which I am trying to awake. Can the two national cultures or the two characters truly connect? 
in this penultimate chapter of Ulysses, there is no intimate narrator to send up the irony, as there is in the hyperbolic descriptions of the citizen and Cyclops, or the vision of dancing coins that decorate the anti-Semite Daisy and Nestor. Joyce, in a way, challenges us or dares us to read the irony of the passage apparently unmediated. It seems we can two ways, choose two ways, right? The first is to despair that any two cultures can ever meet even what seems to be a perfect moment of connection and solidarity. Uh, the second is Margot Norris's claim that this sabotaged climax um, may have an ethical effect. Um, by shocking the reader, she writes, Joyce forces us to explore why such outbursts are produced, to re-examine their historical origins, and to worry about their pernicious effects, not only on Leopold Bloom, but more widely on an entire European population. Uh, in this reading, Stephen ultimately forces us to confront the pressures on the Irish Jewish analogy, which must happen inside history, not outside it. So to me, Joyce seems genuinely to endorse the analogy's potential, and this is the argument I make at length in my book, um, even while admitting its shortcomings and dangers. Um, but he presents in particular the Exodus narrative um, as a kind of um, particular cliche about, rebel, about liberation that he finds value in. Um, one of unsettlement, both national and psychological, rather than a journey to a fixed identity. So I'll just give one brief example of an object that embodies this unsettled identity. It's a seemingly unimportant detail, um, a bar of lemon soap. Uh, this is what it looks like. Um, a bar of lemon soap the bloom buys to take with him to the bathhouse. But the soap is not just soap. It's a symbol of Bloom's Jewishness, linked throughout the novel with the citron, ashrog in Hebrew, the lemon-like fruit used ritually only during the Jewish holiday of Sukkot. Sukkot is a commemoration of the wilderness period in the story of the Israelites' exodus from slavery in Egypt. After Moses leads the people out of Egypt, the Red Sea is parted by God and the people are free. They wander for 40 years before God brings them into the Promised Land. So the lemon soap, which evokes Sukkot each time it appears in the novel, and Bloom even holds and inhales its scent in a way that reflects uh, its religious use. Um, it's a symbol of observance and covenant, but also a sign of broken covenant, uh, hybrid identity. So throughout his day, the soap literally, continually makes Bloom uncomfortable. On at least four different occasions, Bloom points out how it's poking him or making him sticky, and he has to keep moving it from one pocket to another. Um, but the soap is not only a symbol of Bloom's uneasy hybrid identity. It's, um, in fact, a symbol of Jewish identity, as at its core defined by precariousness itself and the commandment that one always remember what it is to be a stranger. During the festival of Sukkot, Jewish families take their meals in a tent-like structure called, called sukkahs as a reenactment of the homelessness of the exodus from Egypt. The celebration of Sukkot dramatically recreates the experience of life in the desert. As Leviticus instructs, you shall live in booths, tents for seven days, so that your generations may know that I made the people of Israel live in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. Just as on Passover, uh, Jews eat only matzah and no leavened bread to replicate the experience of their ancestors' rushed departure from Egypt, um, Sukkot Jews reenact the period of four years of wandering. Jean-Christophe Atias and Esther ben Bassa write that Sukkot is, quote, meant to lead to a rediscovery of precariousness of life in the desert. It clearly signifies a refusal to rest a liberation from subservience to place. For seven days, Israel must quit its stone houses and live in tents in remembrance of the tents God gave the Hebrews as homes when they left Egypt. Lemon soap is then the portable mnemonic for a central theme of Ulysses, 
that human life happens in the unsettlement of the wilderness, even as it seems oriented towards the rootedness of the national. This ethos of unsettlement seems to renounce borders, sees the value in articulating a homeless national origin, the origin in the desert, wilderness instead of promised land. Um, and ideally, this enactment creates solidarity with those who are homeless today, and especially refugees, asylum seekers, immigrants. Which is why back in October during Sukkot, in response to Trump's new anti-immigrant uh, plans, a group of rabbis protested by building a sukkah outside of Trump's tower. More recently, a few weeks ago, uh, an Israeli rabbi writing in the New York Times suggested that Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is, quote, on the wrong side of the Exodus story by insisting that African refugees seeking asylum uh, from Sudan and Eritrea be deported from Israel. Susan Silverman writes that Holocaust survivors and their descendants would take the refugees into their homes. For she asks, how else? during this time of Passover, could we commemorate our own historic redemption? The policies of the Israeli state are often at odds with the anti-territorial nationalism that the Exodus story seems to advocate, the admonition, admonition to remember what it means to be homeless and welcome the stranger. Joyce's principal irony in using the Jewish parallel is precisely its anti-territorial nationalism during a time of vehement Irish territorial nationalism. And uh, in fact, the 1998 Good Friday Agreement is a kind of uh, reversal, um, although the question of Brexit and the Irish border may kind of complicate that resolution. Um, but the Exodus story insists on a memory of homelessness um, that is central to identity, the memory of the desert that opposes life in the promised land ensures uh, as Jan Asman writes, quote, that people live in the world without feeling at home in it, a memory that far from making you feel at home denies you a home. Feeling not at home in one's land is epitomized by the awkward way that Leopold Bloom defines a nation when confronted by the citizen. Not only, quote, the same people living in the same place, but also living in different places. This is Bloom. The citizen asks Bloom if he is, quote, talking about the new Jerusalem. But this misses the point. Nationality is semi-diasporic for Bloom. Um, indeed, his every imagining was stable, promised land, whether for Zionists or Irish nationalists, is at some point, uh, with Bloom's characteristic equanimity, rendered reversible. Moreover, even Bloom has missed the irony of what else the Irish nation is. It's different people living in the same place. Um, so Ruth Gilligan's 2016 novel, Nine Fools Make a Paper Swan, is also a story of unsettlement and hybridity. By looking back at the history of Jewish immigration to Ireland, Gilligan also seems to indirectly address the situation for refugees who come to Ireland today. Gilligan has indeed publicized her novel as an act of radical imagining, uh, part of her work in Colin McCann's Narrative for Collective, which advocates telling a story not your own in order to empathize with the other. Writing what she didn't know, Gilligan is aware, might be misconstrued as appropriation rather than sympathetic imagination. Uh, in an essay in the Irish Times, she asks, what right did I have to tell these stories that were not my own. And Nine Folds has been criticized, and I think maybe not publicly, but uh, certainly among uh, some Irish writers and historians of Jewish Ireland, as a failure to move past stereotypes, uh, a form of cultural appropriation that's using the story of Jewish Ireland to sell books. But the novel seems to me um, itself uh, broadly invested in ironies of connection, just as Ulysses is. In fact, its explorations are most powerful in the section of the book that takes place in the 1950s, and whose central characters are defined not just by their Jewish Irishness, but by their disabilities, physical and neurological. Um, 
Ruth Gilligan may not be Jewish or have a disability, but Joyce was not Jewish either, and neither was his representation of Bloom rooted in the reality of Irish Jewish life. In fact, it's quite clear that Joyce's knowledge um, of Judaism was based on his experience in Trieste, not Dublin. Um, and Cormac O'Brien has, has pointed this out in detail, as well as um, John McCourt and others. In, in response to the charge of cultural appropriation, the writers have occasionally met with the British novelist um, Hari Kundru uh, has perhaps put it best. Sorry, that one. Attempting to think one's way into other subjectivities, other experiences, is an act of ethical urgency. And the difference between an ethical representation of prejudice and an unconscious duplication of it may not always be clear or decidable. Gilligan, like Joyce, addresses directly the topic of Irish-Jewish affinities or analogies, and like Joyce, too, she shows their limits. The thwarted playwright Lithuanian father in the novel, Moshe Greenberg, Tata, to the protagonist Ruth, has finally heard back after mailing his new play called The Fifth Province to the director and Abbey Theatre playwright, Lady Gregory. In this part of the novel, it's in three time periods. This part takes place in 1911, it's the early period. So finally, Lady Gregory replies to the immigrant playwright in a letter that we see in the novel only snippets of to apparently summarize it as, quote, part of the Gaelic revival, using the Jewish plate as a metaphor for that of the Irish. So when Tata goes to Dublin, He's invited to meet Gregory and see her new play and then meet her um, under the portrait of Yeats, Dudley Yeats in the lobby. And Tata thinks he's finally been accepted into the Irish arts community. But like much else in the novel, uh, it is a scene of painful misreading. Ruth's Tata finally face to face with Gregory, quote, poured out his stories his Irish ones and his Jewish ones, just the same really, all the connections he had found, while Lady Gregory listened on, eyebrows cocked in fascination, admiration, maybe even seeing a connection of her own. Um, and this is clearly not Gregory's perspective, right? We learn, in fact, that Gregory has only invited Moshe to confirm the Irish-Jewish analogy central to her own Exodus play that she has invited him to come see. She says, now all this is very good, very good indeed, but I was wondering if I could ask you, Mr. Greenberg, to return specifically to the play. The reason I invited you here tonight to see what you thought, to get an authentic opinion, so to speak. So Gregory has no intention of letting Tata speak, of providing a literal stage for his drama of Jewish-Irish connection. Upon realizing this, walking out of the theater, Tata releases the pages of his play loose to the wind, quote, the flap of them almost like the sound of a thousand wings. The chapter concludes, though, with the final page of the manuscript of Tata's play, which seems to have floated back to us. She stands on an overturned potato crate before the crowd. This is all we see of, of the text of the play itself. Girl, I am here today to tell you that I have found a place where we can go, all of us, a ripple of whispers, of disbelieving eyes. The fifth province it is called, and I have been told we can make it our home and send to our families elsewhere and tell them to come too. Scattered we will be no more, for this island holds the place we have been searching for, the land that God once promised. While Joe Murphy watches on from the sidelines before tipping his hat and kicking his horse to walk on. Of course, the play itself is now the scattered thing, its pages loose to the wind, and Tata's Irish storytelling will have no future. Um, and I think this... Uh, end of a chapter in Gilligan's novel echoes a bit with the end of the Cyclops chapter of Ulysses that we saw before, that shot of the shovel after Bloom's heroic ascension. 
This idea of the fifth province, a space like the wilderness of Exodus, part of the nation but not concerned with its borders, was taken up by President of Ireland Mary Robinson in her 1990 inaugural speech. The recent revival, the recent revival of an old concept of the fifth province expresses this emerging Ireland of tolerance and empathy. The old Irish term for province is cuckoo, meaning a fifth. And yet, as everyone knows, there are only four geographical provinces on this island. So where is the fifth? The fifth province is not anywhere here or there, north or south, east or west. It is a place within each one of us, that place that is open to the other, that swinging door which allows us to venture out and others to venture in. For Robinson, as for the philosopher Richard Kearney, who popularized the idea, the fifth province is a kind of utopia of Irish identity that also includes the other, and even particularly the immigrant other, or the emigrating citizen, those who literally come in and out through the swinging doors. Gilligan's novel is perhaps less optimistic about these aspirations, which may be characterized by hope, but ultimately reveal the limits of hospitality. I was initially troubled by the ending of Gilligan's novel, uh, particularly when the celebration of Christmas, I'm standing in for uh, family and nostalgia, uh, seemed to unconsciously provide some sort of cover for the protagonist Ruth to retreat from the possibility of encountering uh, Jewish traditions. And more broadly, uh, the ending of the novel is pretty bleak in terms of the possibility of successful interfaith marriages. But then, I thought back to that moment in Ulysses I presented earlier, Stephen recounting to Bloom uh, the anti-Semitic ballad and all that irony. Um, and I think that's at work in Gilligan's novel as well. It's not unconscious from the part of the novelist, just the character. In Ulysses, uh, instead of the fifth province, we have the new Blue Musulum in the Nova Hibernia of the future, the novel's fantasy of a space that wears its irony in its very shape. It is a Jewish-Irish promised land that flaunts its non-kosherness by being built, quote, in the shape of a huge pork kidney. <laughs> The new Blue Muslim is made up of 40,000 rooms evoking the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, a space where Bloom tells us there are, quote, mixed races and mixed marriage and where there are no strangers. Fintan O'Toole uh, wrote a few months ago of the Belfast Agreement and its language setting up identities as, quote, fluid, contingent, and multiple. Contemporary nationality, he says, must be open and many layered, as Ireland has discovered. O'Toole writes, quote, this is why the Irish border has such profound implications for Brexit. It is a physical token of a mental frontier that divides not just territories, but ideas of what a national identity means in the 21st century. That was in the New York Review of Books. Uh, the fifth province, with its gesture, as Robinson says, to the four points on the map, hovers above the nation. It reminds me of the Jewish ritual performed on Sukkot, in which the citron is held along with three entwined branches, called the lulav, that are shaken in those same directions, north, south, east, west, and also up and down. The Sukkot ritual is meant to be performed inside the sukkah, that space of the non-place, and also of the displaced. It is believed by some to be a sort of ceremonial call for rain, but it also seems to say, or might say, as does the fifth province, here is an open space, a place without borders. In some ways, Gilligan's audacity is not just her move into Joycean territory, including a character uh, with the Wiccan name of Shem, but also her exploration of the Irish-Jewish affinity at a moment when affinities in Ireland have notably shifted in public discourse from Irish-Jewish to Irish-Palestinian. This was already the case by the 1980s in the North, 
as we see in the visual iconography of the well-known murals there. The one struggle mural depicting solidarity between the IRA and the PLO, for example, and on the other side, murals identifying unionists with Israelis. These reorganized alliances, uh, now also widely present in the Republic, are not, of course, primarily about an end to one solidarity, but um, about the beginning of new ones. As Beatty and O'Brien note in their discussion about Irish Jewish studies, and this is from the edited collection that I mentioned earlier, uh, Irish writers are especially aware of how parallels between groups are, quote, always <coughs> inevitably in flux. They cite both Colin McCann's and Colm Tobin's recent comparisons of Jewish and Palestinian histories and stories and their Irish echoes as sites of exchange, empathy, and bridges to the other. It seems to me, um, and I'm winding up now, um, that this slipperiness between the gestures of solidarity and their apparently inevitable fracturing is being played out not only in these anecdotes and literary texts and political images and affiliations, but also uh, in the scholarly conversation about Irish Jewish studies itself, uh, whether the experiences of Irish and Jews coming together has been characterized primarily by sympathy um, or by anti-Semitism and xenophobia. Historian Natalie Wynn suggests that the major work on Irish Jewish history, namely books by Cormac O'Grada and Dermot Keogh, um, quote, sidesteps conclusions that are potentially uncomfortable for the Irish. She sees their work as reinforcing approved versions of Irish Jewish history that are both nostalgic and anecdotal. The real tensions, she suggests, are being written out. On the other hand, literary critic George Bornstein suggests just the opposite in his recent book, that while the, quote, fissures are an important part of the historical record, they are not the only part, and they have become so prominent that they too often crowd out more cooperative efforts. And I think both of these statements are critical for Irish Jewish studies and coexist. Uh, in other words, it is the shifting terrain itself that constitutes Jewish-Irish studies, or Irish-Jewish studies. Um, it's hyphen, if it has one, uh, doing double service, a cross-cultural and interdisciplinary workhorse, both connective and divisive, both a bridge and a wall. see this sort of uh, interpretation develop. Uh, I was curious at that time, and I'm curious again if you could say a little bit more about sort of the uh, reaction to uh, Ulysses and all these Jewish themes in it, in that sort of like immediate post-publication period. Mm -hmm. Of course, publication is a long piece there, but I'm just struck by this, this theory, right, of this notion of a movement away from Exodus as an imagery. So when it, and it's at the same time as the, the book is published, obviously, and it's, it's its first response. So yeah. what is sort of the, the, the really the you know, early literary and critical interpretation that look at those? Well, I think there. Yeah. That there was very limited early um, interpretation of the Jewish themes. I mean, Joyce himself kind of arranged some of the, the earliest um, you know, thematic material around Ulysses, he kind of created um, you know, these schemata that he would then distribute to, um, 
to, to people, the Lanadi schema and others, um, so that people would kind of know, like, here is the theme of the Exodus, here is the theme of, you know, here are Christian themes, here are, you know, what these colors represent and these numbers and these body parts. Um, so he was quite in control, but I think, um, you know, the real kind of more historical sense and kind of um, unpacking of Irish Jewish themes did not happen right away. I mean, there were so many problems with reception, um, you know, in, in various places and uh, censorship that I don't think there was much of an immediate sense of, of Jewish themes. I mean, in a little, in a limited way. Who's the, see, it's been too long since I've taught the Joyce uh, seminar that now I'm not remembering, but who's, who's um, the, the, that first book? Does anyone remember that first book? Um, it'll come to me. Um, where, where, where it's that kind of authorized interpretation. And then I think, you know, um, with some, like the mid-90s, um, Vincent Chang's book, Joyce, Race, and Empire, Marilyn Ricebaum's book on um, more kind of psychoanalytic and European context of anti-Semitism. But, like, Exodus was long gone from the Irish imagination by the time the book was published, I think. You know, the Easter Rising, really kind of cemented this idea of, you know, blood sacrifice as the narrative of the nation. And this whole thing with <clears throat> Moses and Parnell, um, you know, were, and, and other Irish figures described as the deliverer, which it was so huge in the 19th century, but it, it was really, I think, erased. And by the time Joyce sets the book in 1904, it's like still there with Parnell you know, this promise deliver, but it but it's basically um, it's basically like <laughs> Joyce lamenting <laughs> that, that it's by nineteen twenty two um, been completely lost. I have a kind of a question about contemporary literature and Joyce <coughs> and Ulysses. So you pointed out some of the parallels or some of the self-conscious references to the Ulysses and Ruth Gilligan's novel. Mm. Do you, is there contemporary literature dealing with Jewish-Irish relations that sort of kind of allied Joyce in any way, or is he always the dominating person? Well, I don't think so. I don't think, in a sense, like nobody until Gilligan has the chutzpah to <laughs> do it, right? I mean, like, and I think that's a lot of the sense of kind of um, reaction to her book, maybe. Um, at least partly, right, that this idea of a non-Jew um, taking up this important theme. But of course, you know, Joyce was not Jewish either, although we might kind of, um, we've kind of gravitated towards thinking of him in, the, in this kind of way where he can, you know, do post-colonial studies and Jewish-Irish studies. I mean, he was like one with the modernists for a long, a long time. So I think um, maybe that's part of it. Um, and, and maybe I just don't know. I mean, there's a, there's a book of poems um, at, by Simon. Um, I'll have to look, look up at the name, Contemporary Book of Poems. Are you thinking of it, Caroline? Um, so he, and this author has also been kind of, um, you know, touring with Gilligan, but it's not a novel, right? Um, so I think that sounds of, of, you know, choice and blue. But, you know, I, I see kind of allusions to Ulysses really throughout the novel in interesting ways, you know, the, that kind of end of a chapter where you have the, the elevated and the aspirational and spiritual counterpointed with this kind of bring you back down to earth um, moment. Plus she uses the word schlepped, which Joyce <laughs> uses in Ulysses, you know, um, the woman who schlepped her load, which I think is a, is a great word to find in Ulysses. Was yeah. it derived from the Irish? What's that? Was the word derived from the Irish? Schlecht? I, I mean, my guess is that it's Yiddish, but, um, you know, I think, I, I think uh, it's definitely Yiddish. I mean, I think, you know, Joyce worked so hard to incorporate all of these languages, um, and, and this woman who kind of stands as a figure, you know, crossing the, the globe. Um, I, I think he is looking for, you know, multiple which is probably not the only 
That's really interesting, and I have not thought about that, and I think that might be the case. I mean, I think in that moment with Harry Hughes, Joyce is connecting um, this Harry Hughes narrative and the blood libel story. I think he's connecting it, you know, directly to Pierce and blood sacrifice. He's alluding to Pierce directly there because he changes the story of Harry Hughes. He changes the ballad to a girl dressed all in green. Right, so she's Blame's daughter, she's an Irish girl, so he's kind of, I think, also commenting on the rising, and of course, you know, Ulysses was set in 1904, but published in 22, so um, it makes sense that he's kind of commenting, but I haven't thought about the idea that it's already within it, and um, I, I think that's really interesting. I'm thinking of this other moment, and I think it's the woman who was schlepping, actually, who, um, maybe it's a... See, this is again what happens when you don't understand. She lists these over here. She's thanking her stars she was passed over. Right? It is a different per it's a different moment. Um, the other one is in the Congo Papers scene um, on the beach. But yeah, she's thinking, thanking her stars she was passed over. So Joyce is certainly thinking about that moment as well. Thanks, Abby, so much for the talk. It's amazing. Um, sorry, I have one question. And so I wanted to ask about um, what are the, some of the criticisms that Ruth Gilligan received, because I didn't read any of the reviews, but well, it, it strikes me as like she did a risky thing yeah, in writing the novel. Sure. So was some of the criticisms around cultural appropriation that, they, that they, she felt, pe critics felt she hadn't pulled it off, or has that mostly been informal and more publicly she hasn't gotten those criticisms? Yeah, I haven't seen any. Um, published criticisms, I should say. So this is like off the record conversations um, with writers. I think um, I think there's a sense that, um, you know, I think part of it is she's kind of an outsider to the community and making use of material, um, which is of course a critique that has been leveled at many authors who, you know, speak in the voice of the other. So she's by no means kind of unique in that. And it's an interesting conversation. Um, I think, but um, but on the on the point specifically, you know, there's one thing that I've heard from a couple of different people, which is um, she takes this narrative that is a kind of famous, entrenched, beloved um, mythology or legend about how the Irish got to um, how the Jews got to Ireland, and it, and the story goes that um, they're on a ship, they're going to. Uh, New York, and the boat makes a stop, and um, they hear Cork, Cork, and they think they hear New York, New York, and they get off in Cork and Ireland, and they're there, right? And I think there's a kind of, and, and so she actually takes this story, um, which is repeated to Gilligan, and which, you know, any of us who've worked on this topic have read many times. Um, it's repeated to Gilligan, I think, by everyone she interviews to kind of prepare for the book. And she takes it and she kind of makes it the beginning of her novel, I think in, in quite an interesting way. I mean, it's not like hokey or hammy in the book, right? You, get, you actually get a sense of the trauma of this family who have gotten off in the wrong place. And I find it quite, you know, heartbreaking. Um, but I think there's a sense that, like, kind of, you know, re-embedding this story is, um, that's, you know, obviously fake if you're a historian, um, that is problematic. Mm -hmm. So I think that's one example. Um, there was another question, Alan. Yeah. <coughs> I wonder if you could comment on the fact that if Leopold Bloom 
was supposed to be the archetype for the Jew that James Joyce would set us up to yeah. learn from. What does it mean that he is rather atypical as a Jew? You first meet him, he's frying a kidney in butter while yes. he's mm -hmm. Yes. He's got to bring breakfast up to his non-Jewish wife upstairs. Yes. Yeah. And um, you tell him he's converted yes. to a different faith. Right. So, uh, could you tell me how, the, how <laughs> that the issue with smelling the soap and the yeah. symbolism of the extra notwithstanding, yeah. how does he stand for us as an archetype of the Jew? Right. Um, well, I'm not sure he he does. I mean, I think he does in the sense of, um, you know, kind of the idea of questioning always being within the Jewish tradition itself, right? That, that things are always going to be kind of, um, that, that a kind of questioning discourse <coughs> is all, already kind of within any kind of Jewish tradition or rabbinical tradition or, or whatever that, that Joyce would have been really interested in. Um, I'm not sure he does stand for an archetype of a Jew. And I don't think that Joyce necessarily intended him to kind of stand in as only Jewish. I think he is, is very interested in the idea of him as kind of hybrid and torn. And the question about the lemon soap is it's kind of a symbol not just of being Jewish, right? I mean, he does kind of, you know, unconsciously, certainly, um, or probably, <laughs> he does all of these kind of ritual actions. Um, at the same time as he feels regretful, you know, he feels regretful, you know, to his father about not having, um, you know, followed through on Jewish practices, and, and he thinks he thinks about this with great sadness, even as you say he's you know married his non-Jewish wife. So I think it's always that like tension, um, and you know, kind of split um, identity that that Joyce is interested in, also the idea that the Jew is the other. Um, but that then the Jew is also kind of evocative of just the human, that we are all in some way split or hybrid or other. I don't know. Actually, I should say, Kelly, I don't know what time we have. <laughs> or do we have one more? Okay. Um, is it too far away? I can hear you. Uh, I've been fascinating. Uh, uh, do you think there's a connection with the Agatha and Ulysses, maybe? Yeah, it's in my book. <laughs> I have a chapter about it. I mean, I could go on and on. I, I don't know if they'll want me to wind up. But yes, everything, I think, uh, I mean, I think that is Joyce's main text for Ulysses, his main interest, um, and the, the story of the Exodus. I think specifically look at Ithaca, which is a kind of, um, Haggadah or Passover Seder with all of the all of the elements there, um, including the four questions. And why is this night different from all other nights? Right, one Jewish day, um, the, that twenty four hours in the life of Blue. Why is this night different? And I think, um, in the sense that's that chapter is the answer. Well, join me in thanking Abby Anthony for first. <laughs> session downstairs of her glass of wine.